Okay, so what I want to go to next is this. Hmm. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about negotiating and due diligence with multis. Um, because this is an important part of uh, you getting into this business. Um, remember what I talked about yesterday. I think it's important to consider the idea that when somebody is selling a property, there's a problem to solve a each and every time. Each and every time. So getting, uh, giving the seller what he or she needs and you taking what you want is ultimately what you want to do. There's five rules with this, five rules. Number one, engage in a competent broker. I can't tell you enough how important that is. A good real estate agent or broker is worth their weight in gold. Um, I've been a broker here for quite a while in this state and the thing that I, I guess I've realized over my uh, real estate investing career is that some real estate agents seem to do real estate as a hobby and other real estate agents seem to take it very serious. And if I was starting out and picking a market, like many of you are, I would try to find, obviously, the one that's taking it very serious, in which they know their market, they know how to communicate to their clients, and they have connections. They're networked in which they can find deals, okay? A lot of the deals that you're going to find that are going to make you most of your money are not going to come from the MLS, they're not going to come from home path or home steps. They're not going to come from uh, LoopNet. They're deals that you're going to be able to have networked with that real estate agent or broker. Okay, so it's very important that you um, uh, align yourself with somebody that's good. They can provide a wide range of information about the marketplace. They're an effective third party, and they help keep emotions out of it. And that's something that I always have to remind myself, especially when I'm looking at deals. I've got to keep the emotions out of it. I've got to keep the emotions out of it because it's a natural thing. It's something that you're going to uh, probably battle your whole investing career, okay? Because you'll find a deal, you know what you can do with it, you really, really want it, but the numbers have to work. When I'm looking at a divide and conquer deal, and I know that I'm going to put it through divide and conquer. And uh, I know it without a doubt. I still make sure that those numbers work. Because if for some reason I'm not able to put it through divide and conquer, I'm going to have to run that building as a normal, regular apartment building. Does that make sense? Okay. Number two, justify your asking price. And I guess that has a dual meaning. I always try to find out from the agent or broker that represents the seller how they came up with the pricing they did. How did you get to this price? Because if they're talking about a multifamily unit building, uh, they're going to tell me about the NOI, and they're also going to tell me about the market cap rate that they applied to that price and how they came up with that. That's where I um, can decipher between any issues with that pricing standpoint. Now, here's the flip side of that. I might go through my underwriting on the property and say uh, that my price is about $100,000 less. I'm using maybe a different NOI perhaps, or I'm using a different market cap rate that I've gotten from credible sources. And I want to find out about that, or at least start to open that dialogue with the other agent. So I'm always going to justify my ask or my uh, offer price by the NOI and by the market cap rate. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions? We had a question. Uh, you kind of answered it because when you were saying about justifying the asking price, I was kind of we're on the other side of this, but we want them to justify to us. 
yep, I want to know how they priced it, and I want to know, uh, I want them to know how I'm justifying my offer price, okay? Because that lets them know that I'm an astute investor. I know the market. I know what's happening there. I know how, uh, what's been going on with cap rate. I know what's been going on with the properties NOI itself. I want them to know that. Um, use the income statement to back up my figures. So I'm going to be looking at marketing material perhaps first. And in that marketing material, it's going to tell me a certain net operating income, or at least it should. I'm taking that net operating income and using that primarily in my offer price. I don't want to get into three years of financials yet. I want to use whatever they're giving me on the marketing side because I want to leave room for negotiation. Remember yesterday where we said uh, the negotiating doesn't stop when you get it under contract? I, I, I really want you to follow that premise. Offer price based on the marketing material, negotiating based on your due diligence material that you get. Okay, we got a question in the back. Did Tyler leave again? Tyler, you may want to sit on the end, my friend. Um, in most of the marketing material that they send out, they usually, especially on distressed multifamily, they usually list it uh, with the stabilized or the predicted stabilized. Pro forma. Pro forma. Uh -huh. And how do, you, how do you deal with that? Because they're basing it off the cap rate uh, at the stabilized value. Yeah. Sometimes you'll have on their pro forma and uh, uh, current or actual. Other times you'll just have pro forma. That's fine. If they're giving me that, I'll make an offer sometimes just on the pro forma. But once I get the due diligence, once I get the last three years, say, I'm going to really scrutinize those and see how close they are. And if I don't think I can do A, B, and C, or if I think that I'm giving that seller value or credit for something that I'm going to be doing, I'll adjust from there. I'll adjust from there. So I expect to negotiate even when the, con the property's under contract. I expect to. It's not over. I expect to. Okay? Everybody else good? Okay. So buy on current market value, not future. Now, I know the definition of the income approach is, is the current value of future income. Remember me talking about that yesterday? But this kind of ties in with his question a little bit. You've got to kind of um, ratchet down almost from the pro forma numbers and maybe the pro forma value that they're giving you in saying, number one, how close am I in all actuality with the property right now? Can I do A, B, and C to the property to drive the value? And number three, am I giving this seller credit for something that I'm going to be doing? If I am, I'm probably, most likely, going to ratchet down from that pro forma price pretty good. The other thing, and probably the most important of the four, is this. I might give the seller his or her price because I want the terms. I may give them that price. I want the terms. Remember what I said yesterday. Sellers are motivated by price. Buyers should be motivated by terms. So that's the main reason I look at the marketing material because if I can get close to that marketing price, I know that I have a better chance of getting my terms. Okay? Number three. No. Sure. Hold on one second. What would be an example of you giving the seller credit it, it, what for do you something mean? that you're going to do? So the terms? Credit for what I'll be doing. In that negotiation, you, that was number three yeah. or something. In other words, am I paying that seller a million dollars when the property is only worth about eight fifty today? but I know by doing A, B, and C, we can get the value up to a million dollars? Why would I want to give him that or her that extra $150 when I'm doing the work? Does that make sense now? Okay. Larry? Yeah, so if you, if you got an example that pro form is like they're really unrealistic, 
So last night looking at one like there's no vacancy provision, they're underestimating the maintenance drastically. Do you take that on when you put in the offer and ratchet down the price then or do you just give them their price and then beat them later or what's... Beat them later, did you say? Beat them, beat the, beat them down later. With, beat them the down. Give me that. <laughs> yeah, um, it really depends on the scenario. It depends what I want out of the deal. Um, it depends why they're selling, what their urgency is. Um, that type of thing. I take all those factors into consideration, but if they're way out of line, and I know that by looking at the marketing material, usually they're way out of line for a reason. Um, they're unrealistic in the pricing, they need the money, the broker just priced it improperly, something. And I want to find out why that is. When you have an extremely high, unrealistic value in the marketplace, that property is probably, if it hasn't already, going to sit on the market longer. Remember what I said the second day. As a property sits on the market longer, what grows? The motivation of the seller grows. So that's fine with me because then I'm more opt to get my terms. So I'll look at all that stuff in making my decision. Okay? Good question, though. Wayne, we got Yoshi coming at you. So... Um on your on the uh, your point about the uh, the seller more interested in in price and the buyer on terms, um, if we can just go to the single families for a sec, like that kind of, quite often it seems like they're uh, it's the reverse that um, if they're getting all cash, if they're getting uh, pay a uh, short uh, closing, all the terms seem to motivate the seller and they'll come down a bit on price. Like, can you explain that? Yeah, and Wayne, you're primarily talking about things like on home path, home steps, bank REOs. Uh, even, even other sellers. Okay, um, you'll see that a lot with bank REOs and home path and home steps. Um, they want the terms to be rock solid, typically because they've got an asset on their books that they need to be sure that they're gonna sell. Um, you see a lot of asset managers for banks when they're looking at their portfolios or um, we were on the phone with one in um, with one of Pierre and Louise's deals that uh, we were talking to the asset manager and she you know we got on the phone with her and she was making it clear that her objective was to make sure that we were rock solid and they were going to be able to sell that asset that's what those types of assets and asset managers want to focus on, making sure they get rid of it. So they're really caught up in the terms. Anytime you're going in all cash, uh, you want to make sure that you are closing quickly, uh, very quickly, seven days or less, you've got no contingencies on that. You're more opt to get the deal. The same thing with um, when you're bidding on home path and home steps, they go through a formula and um, the same thing. They want to ensure that you have the cleanest deal possible. Um, other ones, private individuals, I don't know so much if um, it's to that extreme, but you certainly have a scenario where they want to make sure they're closing and the terms become important, specifically when there's some kind of, of um, short sale, they're behind on their mortgage, that type of thing, because they don't want to take the property off the market, waste the time, you not close, and then you know, they're going to ultimately go to foreclosure. That's probably what you're experiencing with that. Um, I think that's a little bit different than a quote-unquote normal transaction uh, on the single-family house side of things, which seems to be the minority today. Um, certainly on commercial deals, multifamily deals, terms become very, very important. Uh, I know we joke a little bit about um, Donald Trump and some of the bigger guys, but they're all about the terms when they structure those deals. Obviously, price is, is a part of that, but the terms are very, very uh, important to them. They use high-level um, creativity, things like air rights and historic transfer credits, and um, uh, they've also got uh, transfer credits themselves. Um, and these are like higher-end level um, terms that they get on those type of deals that really motivate them to get the deal done. Okay, lowers their down payment, gives them advantage on cash flow, things like that. All right. 
You guys good? Where is, uh, I think Heather took my phone. Can I borrow your phone here, Ed? I just want to press that button. All right. What we're going to do is just to try to make up for some time here, we're going to take a little bit of a break in five minutes, and it's going to be a seven and a half minute break. We will start at 10.42 and 30 seconds, and um, uh, we'll continue. We're going to start to get into the deals. How many people brought homework today? And I know I've had about 1,000 people either hand me a deal or say, John, I've got my deal. Could you do mine first? And I've got to come up with a, a fair way to take someone's deal first. So I'm going to think about that. But um, I just want to continue with number four and number five. And then we're going to take a, a little bit of a, a, our true mid-morning break here, even though it's going to be half. Even though it's going to be half. Number four, institute contingencies in your offer. Make sure that you're setting this up. I put on here a 30-day free look. That's kind of the nickname that you get when you have contingencies. I don't think it's, it's right for you to go around putting in offers with the idea that you're probably going to be getting out of that deal. I don't think that's ethical, but nevertheless, this is the nickname that we put on here. Contingencies are important because it allows you enough time to study that investment. That's what the definition of due diligence is. In studying that investment, I really want to make sure that I go back to that skeleton and I'm looking at income and everything that comes into the property as income. I'm looking at expenses and everything that goes out of the property to operate that property monthly. I'm looking at NOI. I'm looking at the debt service that I'm going to put on there. And ultimately, I'm looking at my cash flow. Now, that's one half of my due diligence. The other half is saying, okay, what am I going to do to this property over the next 18 months in which I'm going to drive value? That's the other half of my due diligence and the purpose for it. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking at that. You want to be able to uh, walk away at any time. Again, I just want to pause you on that. Your objective is to not tie properties up to ultimately walk away. Again, I think that would be unethical if you think you're going to walk away for you to tie that property up. But I want you to be able to study that so if something comes up that you don't like on the property that has to do with that skeleton or has to do with the play on the property, you can get out of the deal because of the contingencies or the conditions that are set forth in that contract. I think it's very uh, important. Number five, know when to walk away. Know when to walk away from the property. The, probably the best deals I ever did was the ones I walked away from. I remember once doing a deal in Columbus, Ohio. Columbus is apartment haven. There is a lot of apartments there. It's where, the, um, it's where Ohio State University is. I remember spending about four, just under $40,000 on due diligence for this property. It was a very large property, only to realize that I, w I didn't want to buy it. And I felt like if I did buy it, I was probably going to be uh, in a lot more challenge than if I did not. So I walked away from it, and I actually spent 40 grand. Now, I got some of that back because I was able to um, sell some of my due diligence information. But nevertheless, sometimes you'll go through the time, effort, money uh, to uh, look at studying the investment and buying the property only to walk away, and I think sometimes that's your best move. So don't get caught up in negotiations. If the seller's not convinced, walk away. When I bought that property from um, the gentleman that was pounding his, his fist on the table, uh, when I first made the offer six, or six weeks prior, um, I knew that you know, I was taking a risk. I, I decided that the property was worth X, I put the contract together, I sent that over to the seller, he said no, that's fine. I left it alone, I revisited for six months, and you know his motivation changed. Because time on market changes seller's motivation. Uh, you may be able to get better terms. In that scenario, I did go back in at the same price six weeks later, but I asked for a 10% seller carryback 
Um, and so I was able to not only get the price, but also the terms on that. So if you walk away from a deal, make sure if it's something that you're interested in, put it in your calendar to revisit it in six months or six weeks or eight weeks, somewhere, something like that. And you'll see a lot of times the motivation has changed of that seller. Is there any questions on that? Yep, Yosh? Sorry, buddy. Right here. John, can you just share uh, the example of the 40000 you said that you spent for the due diligence? What, what exactly you spent it on? Yeah, um, I had inspections. That was a big part of it. And there, were, there was a heavy, um, there was an attic mold problem that um, was presented as being white. But as we got into more and more of the units, uh, it was apparent to me that it was a bigger project. And I started to add that up with regard to you know some of the other things that I spent. I had a roofing inspector out there. I had um, um, survey and title work that had started. I had you know a couple of other things that had started, and costs started to build up with that. Um, I did get an Alta survey on the property that I was able to to sell. So I was able to get some of my money back, but not all of it. But certainly those are some of the items that gave me the impression of, you know, if I move forward this, I'm probably going to be spending more than I really want to here. And so I made the decision to get out of that. Yep. Yep, Mike. Sorry. Uh, just a quick question. Um, what's your best comment you put in for the um, one of your terms to be able to walk away at any time? Well, if you're going to think about contingencies with contract law, the first advice I would give you is to sit down with a good attorney in that area, number one, that knows real estate, knows contract law, knows the market that you're in. That's number one. Number two, if you're going to make contingencies in your contract, make them general. Um, in other words, this contract contingent upon the approval of my partner. That's a general statement. The thing that makes that general is there's no time frame component to that. So in other words, I, I have seven days to do that or 14 days to do that. Um, so the more general you can make your contingencies, the better. If you make them general, that would probably give you at least a little bit more of an advantage to be able to walk away at any time. Again, I don't recommend having the idea in your head that you're going to walk away. and. It's a safety net. So generalities in your, your, con, your conditions or contingencies are go, is what's going to make you uh, be able to walk away at any time. Another one would be buyer has the right to inspect the property 24 hours prior to closing. Um, when you put something in there like that, uh, that does give you the right to inspect the property. And if you don't like it, theoretically, you could get out of that, that uh, contract. Now. If the seller has a good attorney or the seller's uh, astute at all, they're probably going to catch stuff like that, but it's worth a shot. It's worth a shot. Sam? Um, I'm sorry. Let's go here, and then we'll come okay, up to you. Okay, and then I'll, pa oh, yeah. I'll pass it up. Uh, I just wondered, uh, we're always, uh, when, we, when we're brought in, we're always told that we should be buying a home from Canada without ever looking at it down here. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that would be as true on the multi-unit side? Um, like, do you, you certainly can do that. There's okay. no problem in, in, in doing that as long as you have a good team on the ground. I always yeah. recommend that. Um, I, I feel that every investor in here is going to have a different strategy. I know that, um, especially on the multifamily side, I want to see it. I want to touch it. I want to go through it. I want to review. You know what I mean? That's me. That's my strategy. Um, I think Steve believes on the multifamily side that as well. We just got done doing a due diligence on site in Phoenix, Arizona of um, 74 units. And uh, so I, I think with multifamily units, it's a little bit different because it's a little bit different animal. Okay. Sam? Um, are there any uh, remediations or compensations that you can uh, or should put in your uh, offer? In case um, the disclosures that, that the seller put in did not really pan out to be right. I mean, he, he did not. Give me an example. OK, let's say the, uh, the, the uh, seller said uh, they are not aware of any problems of such and such uh, mold. Like 
Okay. And your inspection turns out mold. Their mold. Are you able to uh, recoup some of your expenses, uh, uh, the inspection? Uh, Only expenses? if you have some language like that in your contract. Um, if you don't, that's probably kind of your buyer beware kind of thing. And there's risk in everything that we do. We're real estate investors. We know that. But um, as far as other recourse, you would have to probably talk to an attorney on that. Um, but if you have specific language on that that says, hey, if you give us a disclosure that said there's no mold and we do an inspection and we find mold, uh, the seller is required to pay X percent of our inspection costs. If you have language like that, then sure. If you don't, I think it'd be a little harder. Okay? We'll go, we'll go here. How about if we do this? We'll take one more, and then I want you guys to remember your questions because we'll take our break. Our time has moved now, so it's not going to be... 10.42 in 30 seconds. You guys aren't used to that right on time, right? So I'll, I'll tell you what that is. Yes. John, uh, we have a due diligence, and uh, during the due diligence, they find out there's mold and there's whatever, a whole bunch of other stuff. There's a dead Shetland pony whatever in the basement. Maybe. But nevertheless, <laughs> at, when, you, when you bring this up to the seller, the seller says, no problem, give me that list, I'll get it done. Yeah. Well, then what's your... Okay. What are you doing then? I'm going to show you. This next slide is exactly what I'm going to talk about with that, okay? I'm going to show you exactly what to do with his question of, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. Can I answer that when we get back? Sure. Okay. All right, we are going to take, no, let's take the questions after we get back. No, no it's about my taxi cab. It's about your taxi cab. Chris is having a taxi cab to Midway Airport, which is the other Chicago airport, at 3 o'clock, if you'd like to join him, you certainly are willing to. If you don't want to join him, let him know that too. Yeah. <laughs>